Space has become a hotly contested battlefield. And I don't mean that just metaphorically. Space stations with cannons mounted on them, satellites with lasers, missiles for destroying targets and missiles for intercepting them have literally been not only envisioned but also constructed and launched into orbit by the great powers of the world. Some have even been fired. And although all-out war has not begun to take place between nations in space, countries have prepared for the eventuality of violent conflict above our atmosphere for decades. They have designed guns and contingencies and even the occasional doomsday weapon. Would you like to take a look at what's being created? I'm Alex McColgan and you're watching Astrum. Join with me today as we discuss the past, present and possible future of military weapons in space in the hopes that it will give us some insight into how a space-based war between nations might go and what needs to happen to avoid it. From as early as the 5th century BCE, writers imagined vehicles or structures capable of entering space with weapons capable of raining down destruction. Hindu texts spoke of Vimana, flying chariots or palaces with flying saucer-like qualities that transported their occupants into the heavens and could destroy entire cities with their weapons. In the 2nd century, Syrian author Lucian of Samosata wrote a short novel containing such elements as travelling into space and an interplanetary war between denizens of the sun and the moon. But it has only been in the last century or so that these imaginings could actually be shaped into a reality. As the first liquid propellant rocket began to be launched in 1926, suddenly it became possible to reach higher as a species than we had ever done before, to not just enter the skies, but to pass beyond them. And of course, the technology was almost immediately turned to militaristic purposes. Nazi Germany quickly saw the advantages of rocketry and began developing their V2 rockets, which skimmed the edge of space, reaching 80 kilometers before raining down destruction from the sky. Fortunately, this breakthrough came too late in the war to change how it ended, but V2 rockets became at least the progenitor of the first human space weapons. They may have only skimmed space themselves, but their descendant, the intercontinental ballistic missile of 1959, was able to enter space truly. It's fortunate that the war ended when it did, as Nazi scientists were considering other, more imaginative weapons that could be used from space. Some of what they were contemplating seemed the sort of thing you might watch in a James Bond. As early as 1929, Hermann Obert, a Transylvanian Saxon-born physicist and engineer who later became one of the founding fathers of German rocketry, was chalking up designs for a 100 meter wide concave mirror that could be placed in space to concentrate sunlight into a single destructive point. The sun gun Sonnengewehr idea was picked up by German scientists who dreamed of making the superweapon a reality. They hoped that its power would allow them to burn entire cities with its heat. Again, fortunately, the war ended before that particular vision could be made a reality. The birth of rockets had a twofold effect on modern space conflict. The first was the increased development of further and further ranging rockets which gained increasingly powerful payloads, accumulating in the nuclear weapons the superpowers of the world hold on standby today. But the second was the development of the more commercial use of space. When Sputnik 1, the first artificial satellite, was launched in 1957, humanity began to realize that space could be used for more than just a place to fire weapons from. Since then, we have launched over 8,000 satellites into orbit around Earth, they contribute hugely to modern society. Through satellite guidance, our phones can know where we are currently and can guide us to any destination by the shortest route. We can communicate in an instant with people on the other side of the world. With this, economies flourished and nations began to realize how devastating it would be if we ever lost them unexpectedly. And so, a new front opened up in space conflict, the Satellite War. Nations began trying to figure out how to protect their own satellites 
while inhibiting the satellites of others should the need ever arise. Different nations took different approaches to this. The Soviet Union in the early 1960s sought to protect their own space interests while threatening others by launching the secretive Almaz space station. This manned space station was unlike any other in history that we know of, as it came with a built-in cannon attached to its front forward belly, capable of firing thousands of rounds a minute. It wasn't perfect. Recoil on such a powerful weapon was a big issue for the whole space station, and it had to be aimed manually by turning the entire space station to point at its target. But this weapon was actually tested in space in 1975, firing about 20 shells at a gas canister target. The result of the test are classified, so we don't exactly know how it went. But a few years later, Project Almaz was scrapped on the grounds of being too expensive and inefficient. So you can draw your conclusions yourself. However, one of the greatest weapons of satellites is not in their destructive power, but in their ability to gain information. Satellites can capture footage of events on the ground in incredible detail, as well as having the ability to listen in to stray signals for espionage purposes. While in 1966, the United Nations General Assembly signed into international law the Outer Space Treaty, making it illegal to place weapons of mass destruction into orbit and encouraging the peaceful use of space, using satellites to spy on your enemies appears to have been deemed fair game. Each superpower makes use of satellites to conduct reconnaissance on sites of importance. About one-fifth of all satellites are military-owned and are used for this purpose. Many, such as the large, American-owned Orion satellites, can hoover up all the telephone calls and signals that telephone towers radiate into space using their massive 100-meter diameter antennae. Since phone calls stopped running through wires and started being broadcast wirelessly, it has become much easier for military organizations to intercept every single communication. Tapping into wires is a thing of the past. Your privacy, likewise. Naturally, countermeasures to this have started to arise as nations and groups object to their privacy being invaded like this. One interesting modern-day facet of this can be seen at play in the Russian-Ukraine war right now. Satellites play a powerful role in modern conflict, allowing military forces to track enemy combatants and relay that information back to units on the ground. However, this is much less effective in Ukraine ever since large swaths of the battlefield became subject to GPS jammers. GPS jammers work by flooding the bandwidths used by GPS satellites with noisy radio signals of their own, drowning out the vital positioning information or spoofing it. Attack drones have played a prominent part in the Ukraine conflict. If you convince GPS that your city is miles away from its actual location, drones will attack the wrong site, getting confused about where they are supposed to go. This is an actual technology that is being employed in a war setting today. It represents space technology being used as an asset in conventional ground warfare. That said, at the time of writing, no space war where a space target attacked another space target has ever taken place. But that's not to say that nations are not preparing for the eventuality. America and Russia have been developing anti-satellite missiles, or ASATs, since the 1950s. Some have even been fired. The US has launched only one test ASAT, which took down a failing commercial satellite in 1985 using infrared heat-seeking as guidance and then crashing into it at 24,000 km an hour to destroy it, the kinetic energy alone being enough to knock the satellite out of the sky. Russia destroyed one of its own satellites in 2021 with an ASAT of its own. Unfortunately, that particular test ended with the satellite splitting into 1,500 pieces of debris that started orbiting the planet. Debris got threateningly close to the International Space Station, and Russian astronauts had to shelter in place to avoid a life-threatening situation. This is the great difficulty of modern space conflict, and is perhaps a reason why it is not more common. Destroying an enemy satellite might simply turn it into a ball of debris 
that then crashes into other satellites, perhaps even your own, which then disintegrate and hit other satellites in a growing cascade of destruction that closes off space for everyone. This is known as Kessler Syndrome, and it could take centuries before space is safe enough to travel through once it happens. For this reason, there are growing calls for ASATs to be banned from use. No one wants space shut down for everyone. That's about the current state of space warfare. However, there is one future technology that might not actually be so futuristic that might change just about everything. Lasers. Yes, you heard me right. Lasers. Pew pew indeed. While this might sound like something out of Star Wars, real life companies like Lockheed Martin have developed working prototypes that have real implications for future conflict. Unlike sci-fi lasers, real-life ones focus on a target with incredible precision, superheating whatever enters its gaze for too long. They come with a multitude of advantages. Shooting in wavelengths outside the visible spectrum, they are both silent and invisible. You'd only know you were being shot by the fact that the engine of your vehicle was suddenly a melted puddle. They are precise. Only your engine might be melted. They come with unlimited ammo as long as they are on a suitable power grid, and they can take out missiles from kilometers away on a clear day. Of course, they come with one major disadvantage. They don't necessarily work if it's not a clear day. Scattering of the laser in atmosphere significantly reduces its effectiveness as the particles lose their coherence the further they travel, and if it's a foggy day, or if the enemy target throws up a smoke screen, the laser can be neutralized completely. It would be unfortunate if you failed to take down an enemy missile because it was cloudy. But this might not be an issue for space conflict, as there is no atmosphere in space. A satellite equipped with such a laser and a suitable solar panel array could potentially bore through the heart of other satellites with ease, leaving their internal components as molten slag without creating a dangerous debris field. It would be extremely difficult to see what had done the damage, meaning the secrecy of your satellite would be maintained. Your satellite would never need to be reloaded, provided it didn't need to vent gas. As it gained its power from the sun, and its range would be vastly increased due to the lack of atmosphere. The only downside would be the need for a powerful enough battery pack, which, given its size and bulk, might be a limiting factor. A few attempts have even been made at creating a laser weapons platform in space that could attack ground-based targets. Again, the appeal of such a threat is great. Imagine that a nation had the capability to instantly assassinate a target, invisibly and without warning, the moment they stepped outside. There would be no room for interception. The US was working on space-based lasers in 1987 with its Project Zenith Star, and although that never made it past ground testing, their military has continued to toy with the idea in the decades since. The USSR nearly actually launched such a laser the Polya spacecraft, in 1987, only for the USSR President Gorbachev to forbid firing it in case the Western government saw this as an aggressive act. As it happens, the launched Polya space laser never reached orbit. An error caused it to burn up in the atmosphere during launch, so the question of whether to test fire it or not was thankfully moot. These are the attempts we know about. Still, I would not be surprised to learn that one nation or another had secretly put a satellite with a laser into space. We'd likely not know for another 30 years or so, or until it was used. Fortunately, space conflict to date has mostly been about hypothetical preparation, more than actual battle. Even during the Cold War, no nation actually has gone so far as to attack another nation's space assets, although many have sought the capability to do so, and more than a few sabers are rattling. This may be because, if we actually started warring in space in earnest, we would be unleashing some of the most devastating forces known to man. 
Weapons from space are perhaps the most destructive humanity will ever bring to bear. It wouldn't take a Nazi sun gun. All it would need is the force of gravity and the realization that with a little mass, you can redirect one passing space rock to have it become a multi-kiloton nuke as it releases its kinetic energy in one frantic moment. But like the gun on the space station Almaz, such weapons have a habit of recoiling. Taking down enemy satellites might sound like an advantage, but Kessler syndrome bringing down the global economy would be bad for everyone. Tactically targeting any enemy with a space launched asteroid might sound nice and useful until you remember the dinosaurs and realize we only have one single fragile rock to live on. Ultimately, the risks that come with space conflict are perhaps the strongest reason it may never happen. I certainly hope so. After all, it would perhaps be a terrible irony and a failure of evolution if humanity's struggle for survival against each other ended in nobody winning and the ruin of us all. What a cosmic own goal that would turn out to be. If you're like me, one of the things you love about space is the incredible beauty of the vistas we find out there. Our solar system is filled with views of planets and other objects that make my jaw drop in awe. If that's true for you too, then I'm excited to introduce the sponsor for today's video, myself. I've released two collections of disc plates showcasing 11 different objects in our solar system, celestial bodies that I find really exceptional. Each comes in two different styles, zoomed in planet horizons or full planet discs with their accompanying moons, all based on real imagery where it was available. I love how they've turned out, so much so that I've put them up in my own house too. Use my link in the description below and you'll even get them with a 20% discount automatically added at checkout. Give it a click and see for yourself. Thanks for watching and thanks to my patrons and members for your support. If you want your name added to this list, check the links below. All the best and see you next time.